Let me quote from the Journal of the American Medical Association. Quote, the introduction of television in the 1950s, just the stuff in the 50s, caused a subsequent doubling of the homicide rate, i.e., long-term childhood exposure to TV is a causal factor behind approximately one half of the homicides committed in the U.S., or approximately 10,000 homicides committed annually. They go on to say that if, hypothetically, TV technology had never been developed, there would today be 10,000 fewer homicides each year in the U.S., 70,000 fewer rapes, and 700,000 fewer injurious assaults. The American Medical Association said just a few years ago that the number one healthcare emergency in America is media violence. Every single major medical scientific body in the world that has ever looked at this topic has come to the same clear-cut conclusion. The National Institute of Mental Health in 1982 assessed 2,500 scholarly studies from around the world and came to the conclusion that there is a clear consensus about the link between media violence and real-world violence. As the child gets older, and now we have the classical conditioning. Remember Pavlov's dog? Remember where you associate the bell with the food and the salivation and all that business? Well, what happens to the kids is this. They get to a certain age and they realize that it's not real anymore. They realize that it's not real, and they wonder how to respond, and they learn to laugh and cheer in response to it. They learn to associate pleasure with vivid depictions of human death and suffering. The Japanese were the real masters at this. What the Japanese would do is, uh, in World War II, they would take out an enemy prisoner, a Chinese or a, an American or a British prisoner, and they'd tie him up to a stake, and then they'd have their young, unblooded privates all gather around him, and one of those privates would take the bayonet and they would bayonet this enemy prisoner to death. A brutal, horrific, long, tragic way to kill another human being. And while that Japanese private was butchering this individual, what did all the other privates do? They cheered and they laughed and they mocked his suffering. And then that night they were given the best meal that they've had in months and the sake is shipped in and the comfort girls are shipped in and they learned to associate human death and, and suffering with what? Pleasure, pleasure. Now our children are sitting in the movie theaters and they're watching vivid depictions of human death and suffering. What do they do when they see somebody being vividly, horrifically, brutally murdered on the screen? They cheer and they laugh like those Japanese soldiers and they learn to associate it with their favorite candy bar and their favorite soft drink and their girlfriend's perfume. And they become systematically not just desensitized to human death and suffering, but they learn to actually associate it with pleasure. After the shootings in Jonesboro, one of the high school teachers that's right next door to the school where the shootings happened came to me. And she said, you know, all this stuff, all this stuff that you're talking about as far as this violence enabling in the media, I saw it in my kids yesterday. Now, the high school is right next door in this kind of rural school district. These are the big brothers and the big sisters of the, of the kids that have just been shot to bits. She said, we heard the shots and I ran to the office to find out what's going on. She said, I came back to my high school classroom with tears in my eyes, the most horrible moment in my life. And I told my students, the sounds that you just heard was somebody shooting a bunch of the middle schoolers. And she looked at me with horror in her eyes, and she said, you know what they did when I told them that? They laughed. They laughed. Now, they weren't laughing later, and they weren't cheering later. An hour later, when the reality had set in, but society had taught them to laugh and cheer at human death and suffering like the Romans sitting out there in the Colosseum laughing and cheering at death and suffering. The next step is operant conditioning that makes killing a conditioned response, an automatic, reflexive conditioned response. What are the kids doing when they play the video games? The kid puts a quarter in that video game and picks up a gun. What is he doing? Stimulus response, stimulus response, stimulus response, stimulus response. Not hundreds, but thousands and thousands of times they are being conditioned to immediately, reflexively, mercilessly, brutally gun down their fellow citizens. When you're out there on the firing range, if you point your gun in the wrong direction, if you fire in the wrong direction, you fire at the wrong time, what happens to you? Very bad things happen to you. And that's the way it ought to be because that discipline is the factor that makes it possible for your society to entrust you with lethal force. If you do not have that discipline, then what you have is individuals who are capable of the violence, but without the discipline. And that is what happens when the kids play the video games. They point and shoot and point and shoot and point and shoot. Now understand that the military and the law enforcement 
You've only got to go be qualified about once every six months to really be at your peak. All you got to do is go fire 50 rounds once every, uh, every six months, and the conditioning is there. Where the kids, they're doing these things weekly. These point-and-shoot video games, they're not video games, they're firearms trainers. Our only advantage as warriors has generally been in our training. But you know what? The training advantage is now being lost because they're able to get thousands and thousands of hours on the range and fire thousands of shots for just a few quarters. Kids across America today have an immediate expectation that when they pick a gun up in their hand, they will kill. They will shoot. You know, as a hunter, you spend days in the woods and never fire a shot. A policeman, a soldier, spends weeks and weeks carrying a weapon around and never fires a shot. But the kids across America have this expectation that when they pick up a gun, the first thing they'll do is they will shoot, and they will shoot at what? Human beings. Now, I want you to understand how powerful and effective these things can be. Let me give you another case study. And this is the most powerful one that I've ever seen. It happened in a place called Paducah, Kentucky. A kid by the name of Michael Carneal, a 14-year-old kid, walks into school with a 22 caliber pistol. Now, Michael Carneal had never fired a pistol before in his life, before stealing that gun from a neighbor's house and firing a couple of practice rounds. His parents had protected him from guns for a lifetime. He had fired a 22 caliber rifle one time at camp. He walks into the school and he fires eight shots. Now, the FBI says that less than 20%, less than one bullet in five of the rounds fired by trained, qualified, hardened, conditioned law enforcement officers hit their target. It's very hard to hit moving targets. Most people don't sit there and cooperate and hold still for you while you're shooting at them, number one. Number two, the stress of killing another human being puts you over the top. Number three, the potential of bullets coming back at you. You add those together, and it's astounding that we get one bullet in five in on the target. Now, Michael Carneal, 14-year-old boy, had never fired a pistol before, fires eight shots. How many hits does he get? Eight shots, eight hits on eight different kids. Five of them are head shots. The other three are upper torso. Well, the thing you need to know about this kid was he was the master of the video games. His parents had arcade-quality games in the house, and he had shot and shot and shot and shot. And so what happened was he came in, he planted his feet, and he never moved his feet. He held the gun up in a two-handed stance, and he got this blank look on his face. And then he began to open fire. Now, there weren't a great quantity of kids in front of him. There was a prayer group that had just broken up and were splitting up. It wasn't like there were hundreds of kids in front of him. There were just a couple of dozen targets. He held the gun up. He never fired far to the left. He never fired far to the right, never far up, never far down stood there with that blank look in his face and put one shot in everything that popped up on his screen. What was he doing? He was playing a stinking video game. And this business of one shot in every target, this is really astounding. It is not natural to fire one shot at every target. It's not natural. The natural response is to do what? To shoot until the target drops and then move on to the next target. Where did he get this one shot at every target business? What do the video games teach you to do? If you're really, really, really good, what are you going to do? One shot and don't even wait for them to drop. Go to the next and the next and the next. And you know, you know they're going to drop because you've done it thousands of times. And oh, by the way, the video games give bonus effects for what? Headshots. Headshots. In the annals of military and law enforcement and criminal history, I cannot find an equivalent achievement. The military and the law enforcement community has always used role models. We have had role models that we hold up in front of individuals, and we call them heroes, and we give them medals, and they commit acts of incredible valor on the battlefield, and we say, if you do the same thing, we'll make you famous too. And for 5,000 years of recorded human history, these role models have been the single most valuable and useful tool that we use to inspire people to engage in acts of disciplined violence for their civilization. Well, now what happens is the kids are getting role models. Jason and Freddy and sociopaths on the movies. 